couple of years ago, I was invited to a dinner party at one of those beautiful big white houses in Notting Hill that had paintings on the wall made of paint. <laughs> there were about a dozen people there, and I really felt I'd finally yeah. arrived. There were editors, senior journalists at the FT, a publisher, a writer, two heads of think tanks. And the conversation was moving fast. I started to feel a little bit out of place. I wasn't as well informed, I wasn't in the know. I couldn't keep up with the conversation and I started to fall silent. There was a young woman there, a good deal younger than the other people present, nicely dressed, and she said a few words. It quickly became apparent that she'd made the mistake of coming with a regional accent. <laughs> she too fell silent. A little while later, she disappeared. Her partner went looking for her, and he came back into the room, and he said, my girlfriend has accidentally locked herself in the downstairs bathroom. <laughs> the host gets a toolbox, and we all gather around the heavy oak, tightly fitted door, doing manly stuff, to no avail whatsoever. We rang a locksmith, the locksmith said he would be three and a half hours. <laughs> Dinner was served. had an inspiration. He got six pieces of prosciutto <laughs> and he slid them <laughs> under the bathroom door to the poor woman trapped inside. Conscience is clear, we sat down <laughs> to eat. And the first subject of conversation was the cause of the riots. One of the guys there had been doing some research and he discovered that a much underreported cause of the riots was the lyrics of rap music being listened to by angry young inner city black men. Understandably, his theory was well received and people talked about it at some length and they shared terrible lyrics with each other and the conversation broadened down a little to talk about the effects of benefit dependency and the lamentable failure of immigrants to integrate themselves properly into our society. And at a certain point, I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and I slammed my lightly oaked Chardonnay down on the table. <laughs> and I said, for the past decade or so, it seems that every major institution of our society has squandered our trust, our belief, that they are there to serve all of us and not just the few. Beloved institutions covering up decades of child abuse to protect their own good name. A criminal justice system, from Stephen Lawrence to the Leveson Inquiry, revealed to be protecting the interests of its own people rather than the most vulnerable people in society. A press 80% owned by just six billionaires, at least one of whom is suspected of paying UK taxes in the last couple of years. <laughs> and one thing you did not read about in their press was the wide-scale systematic fraud and abuse and malfeasance by most of our large banks and financial institutions. Misreporting interest rates, mis-selling payment protection insurance, fiddling with the forex markets, fiddling with the interbank rate, insider dealing in the dark pools of Wall Street, and profiting from wide-scale money laundering and tax evasion onshore and offshore to an extent that would put a London property developer to shame. And then our expense-fiddling elected representatives turned around and they told us that we were to blame, that the poor were to blame, the weak, the immigrant, the disabled, that the most powerless and the most blameless would have to pick up the price. 124 billion pounds we paid to bail them out, not counting the immeasurable costs of unemployment and small businesses going to the wall. And they presided over the diminution of our public spaces and the running down of our public services, squandering our shared commons of education, healthcare, and public housing for all. And you think, Rap music, lyrics, 
called the riot. That is exactly what I said in my dreams. <laughs> Actually, I said nothing at all. Why? Why not? I have been told repeatedly, and I have believed deeply, that anger is inappropriate, misplaced, and counterproductive. But recently, I have begun to doubt this. Firstly, the motives of the people who tell us this are deeply suspect. It is so much in their interests that we don't become angry, or that we become angry with the wrong things. There's a wonderful philosopher at University College London called Amir Srinivasan, who has talked eloquently about this, and she describes how these archetypes of the angry young black man, and the angry woman, and the angry Muslim, are actually instruments of political control, silencing our true voice. The question is not whether we become angry. In fact, we can't help but feel anger when we see injustice and unfairness. The question is, what do we do with it? How do we make it generative? How do we put it to work in the world? How do we make it not unproductive, but productive? And recently, I feel as though I found one small part of the answer to this question. A year ago, I joined an organization called Change.org, which is a global petition platform open to all for people who want to change something in the world that upsets them. Currently have about 150 million users and growing fast. Now my friends who, uh, like me, are middle-aged, middle-class, middle-bloody everything, they were not impressed. At the kind of dinner parties that I normally go to, uh, they said, do these kids really think they're doing politics when they click on a button saying, I agree, and share it on Facebook? I mean, it's too easy. And there's two things I want to say to them. Firstly, I said, look at us. You know, we resigned from the Labour Party over Iraq or the Lib Dems over tuition fees. We stopped going on marches years ago because it's childish and pointless and rather time consuming. <laughs> we stopped helping development NGOs after we read The White Man's Burden. I mean, all we do now is sit around places like this and get cross about the world and we achieve absolutely nothing. And secondly, said so our democracy for all its flaws is partly gifted to us by the great Chartist movement. And the charter that underpinned the Chartist movement was a petition. A petition is just a starting point. It is the moment at which you find your voice, reach out and make common cause with other people. And once you've found those people, there is almost nothing that you cannot achieve. Let me bring this to life with two small stories. A couple of years ago, a woman called Lindsay Garrett, an NHS worker, woke up to find a letter from her landlord, an American investment company, telling her that her rents and those of the other 92 residents of her estate in Hoxton in London were to have their rents trebled, contrary to written promises. She describes the moment at which her initial feelings of uh, sadness and shock, her family lived there for generations, turned to anger. And with that anger, she firstly set up a residence association who elected her chair. She then started a petition on change.org and all 93 residents signed it and then she took it out into the local markets and she took it to the press and she sent it to celebrities. One third of a million people signed that petition. 
American investment company gave up and transferred ownership to a charity of the housing estate, but more importantly, the conversation about the evisceration of social housing in London and across the country uh, was moved up a level, and that conversation is still going on. Over the Channel, in France, a couple of years ago, there was a woman called Jacqueline Sauvage. She had suffered over 40 years of violent abuse, as had her children, by her husband. On the 9th of September, 2012, her son committed suicide. On the 10th of September, she took her husband's hunting rifle and shot him three times in the back and killed him. She was found guilty of murder. She appealed. The appeals failed. Three remarkable feminists, Karine, Carole, and Veronique, who were all running campaigns in her defense, decided to bring their campaigns together and turn it into a movement. Half a million of their fellow French citizens joined that movement. And they held vigils up and down the country, demonstrations, they got articles written in the press, they persuaded their elected representatives to start to support them. And finally, President Hollande, contrary to his previous promises, gave a presidential pardon to Jacqueline. Now, not only was this a just ending to an absolutely tragic story, but just much more important than that, people were emboldened by the fact that the president could be persuaded to change his mind. The laws around domestic violence and self-defense have started to be changed in France. The conversation and the nature and the understanding of it and the way the police treat it and the way the press write about it has been changed. This, from one small tragedy, starts to turn into a systemic change. So where do we go from here? We're really just getting started. We're going to put more tools onto the platform for people to make change in the world. We're going to allow them to raise money for themselves for organizations, for campaigns, for legal challenges, allow them to connect more easily with each other, to join their campaigns together into movements, and to start conversations with decision makers and allow decision makers to respond to petitioners and explain what they can and can't do. We're right at the beginning of our work. Now, at the end of the evening, the woman was released from the bathroom by the locksmith. And I discovered that she and her partner uh, lived in Brixton, which is where I live, and I shared a cab home with them. And I turned to her in the cab and I said, what do you do? And she said, I'm a barrister. I said, oh, what kind? She said, I'm a human rights barrister specializing in immigration. And I said, I wish you'd been at the dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> So you could, have, you could have argued with them. And she looked at me and she said, um, I'm glad I wasn't. I wouldn't have argued with them. With bastards like that, there's no point. I only would have got angry. Well, it is my profound belief that we have to allow ourselves to get angry about injustice. And that when we nurture that spark with compassion, with mutual respect, in common cause with others, we can change the world. <laughs>